So we just want to welcome a special group that traveled all the way from Hesivi. Hesivi in Brazil. I look at in the Google, it takes at least 36 hours to get here minimum. Wow, you know. So I want to welcome uh, Bill, Rachel. Can you stand up so we can see you? And the team, the team from Brazil, Carlos, a team of 10 of them. Thank you for being with us. Um, they are. They have a one. I went. Uh, I went to uh, the website. They have a wonderful ministry working with prostitutes, working with, and they have. You know, we've been talking about the last two years about church without wall. These people have been doing it. They go to the street and they have a church. So we'll have a video to show us. Brazil is the number two sexually trafficked country in the world after Thailand. There are over 500,000 women living as prostitutes in Brazil and exponentially more worldwide. It is estimated that beyond this, there are between 250 to 500,000 Brazilian child prostitutes. We are headquartered in Recife, Brazil. In this city alone, nearly 600,000 people of the 3.9 million of the metropolitan area live in the slums, and poverty is the main driver behind prostitution. This is why we exist. Shores of Grace Ministries dream and work to free the prostitutes. We prevent through the relationships we build in the communities and the God encounters we lead at Street Church. We rescue through our Father's Love Ministry as we build relationships, disciple, and help the women who work in prostitution to dream a God-sized future. We bring healing and recovery through the work at our rescue home, Bethany Villa, for the infant boys and girls up to age 18 who come with nowhere to turn, and our transition home, Hadassah House, to provide a support system and a home to girls who age out of the system. We equip the church through our schools to do the work of Christ and to meet his sons and daughters right where they are, in the streets, in the marketplace, and in the communities. We equip the locals and the women on the streets as we serve coffee and Jesus at the Shores Cafe. We work in Recife, Fortaleza, and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the U.S. We won't stop until we see a revival among the poor and reformation in the areas of prevention, intervention, and restoration of individuals and families through the revolutionary love of God expressed in fellowship, discipleship, education, shelter care, adoption, and cultural transformation. So join us to bring his sons and daughters home into our Father's arms. Gather with other believers to bring a school of the streets near you. Attend one of our schools in Hasifi, or support the Lord's work at shoresofgrace.com slash donate. Isn't that amazing? I went to the website and I got touched already. Uh, just for your information, we will be setting up a fund that we will be work, uh, working towards uh, the ministry. So any of you who would like to donate or give, uh, pick up an envelope. Uh, and, and put in SOG, Shore of Grace, and then uh, the church will help us uh, channel it to the ministry there. So without further ado, can I welcome uh, Brother Nick. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Are any of you wondering why I don't look very Brazilian? <laughs> I'm actually from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but we've lived in Brazil for nine years now and um, have given our lives for reaching these women and children in Brazil who have been so affected by prostitution and abuse and abandonment. And we're really excited to be here in Singapore. It's our first time, at least our first time, not in the airport. In fact, it's cool that you guys are going to Nepal. Nepal is a country that's really on our hearts. And uh, one of our closest friends has been a missionary in Nepal for 40 years. And Rachel and I have been twice to Nepal and, and served uh, in short-term missions there. And we stopped in Singapore on the way. But the last time, that was 20 years ago. And we're excited to get to see uh, more of the city, more of the country, and all of you beautiful people from Singapore. And we're so thankful to be here at Petra Church 
and want to thank all the pastors for having us. It's a great honor to be here with you all. Um, I have a few different things in my heart, and for any of you who have, have spoken before, when you have three or four messages competing inside of you, it can be kind of interesting. Um, but just go with me. Just Are you guys cool with flowing with me here today? Yes. Good. Because I'm going to flow either way, but it's much cooler if you guys are with me. So um, I was reading on, on your website the other day. I think that the statement of the church is something like, we are a family that raises sons and daughters of the Father to reveal the glory, something like that, to reveal his glory. Um, I love that. That is such a beautiful uh, motto for the church, such a beautiful statement of a church. Because actually, that is the statement of the church as well. And just as I was reading that the other day, I think it was yesterday, on your website, God just put on my heart John 1, 18, which is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And I just want to read it with you, and then we're going to share a little bit, uh, some stories of what God's doing in Brazil. But just one thing I want to encourage you with, um, don't listen today with a mindset of, oh, cool, look at what God's doing in Brazil. Because something that I've learned is the things that we see God do on a daily basis through the women, the children that we work with, teaches me as much about myself and about who God is as much as it does in the lives of the people we're reaching. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. So we should never kind of turn our hearts to think uh, almost like Christian entertainment. Oh, cool, look what God's doing over there. No, what God is doing in the lives of people in Brazil, God wants to do in the lives of people in Singapore and the lives in all of the nations. You know what's beautiful about the family of God is that God does not look upon uh, the, the, his family segregated into nations, but he sees one universal body in all nations. And we have one father. Isn't it amazing that we can go anywhere in the world and we have family anywhere that we go? Amen. Anywhere that we go, because we all have the same papa. And so uh, I love that message, and, and it, I really think it's probably rooted in this passage. Um, so I want to share with you guys in John 1, 18, this is John talking about the purpose of the Messiah, the purpose of Jesus coming, and he just got done saying that he came to be the light in the darkness, and the light was the life of men, and the word became flesh. But listen to this statement he says in John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father has explained him or has revealed him, has made him known. No one has seen God at any time, but Jesus... Some translations would say the intimate son who is in the bosom of the father has made him known. Everything that you see in the ministry of Jesus in his time on earth was for this purpose to reveal the father. Everything that he did. You could say, well, Jesus came to save us from our sins. Actually, that does not describe enough the kingdom message of the gospel. Jesus did not come only to save us from our sins. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth so that heaven and earth would be made new, and he came and inaugurated his kingdom on earth. But now think about one who is coming to inaugurate a kingdom. When we look at worldly examples, when there's a new kingdom or a new government or a new regime in any kind of country, we don't usually see one coming and talking about a beloved son who's in the bosom of a father. We see force and we see violence and we see control and we see political manipulation. But what did Jesus do? Jesus comes and he comes to simply reveal the father. How did he establish his kingdom? He came to establish his kingdom by saying, for God so loves the world that he sent his only son so that none should perish, but all would have eternal life. So everything that Jesus did was to reveal the Father. When Jesus healed the sick, he healed the sick to reveal that God is a Father who heals. When Jesus cast out demons, he cast out demons to reveal a loving Father who sets us free. Everything that Jesus did was to reveal the Father. You know how we know this? One, because this verse tells us that this is the purpose of Jesus coming. But second, Jesus himself says in John 5, 19, the son can do nothing apart from the father. All that I do, I do that I have already seen the father do. I only do what I see the father doing. So everything that Jesus did was to reveal the love of the father. Isn't that amazing? Is that amazing? 
See, we, we have a loving papa, and I love that the worship team sang that song, Good, Good Father. It's one of our favorites. Because we work with people who, to them, even the word father is a bad word because of the abuse that they have been through. Does that make sense to you? When you say father to our girls who have been abused and many of them prostituted by their own parents, father to them, they don't get this idea of a loving, good father who loves me and that's who I am. My identity is loved by him. They don't understand that. And see, Jesus came to a world that didn't understand what a loving father looked like because he came to a world that had been so perverted and distorted by sin that there was no longer a clear image of who God was. This is why John says, no one had seen him. Think about that. We have an entire Old Testament of stories of people who conversed with God, who God visited. Moses was called a friend of God. Abraham was also referred to as a friend of God. And yet John says, none of them saw God because Jesus revealed the Father. How do we know who God is? Because we see him as a father. You know, it's amazing about Jesus revealing God as father. We've been here a few days in, in Singapore for about a week and experiencing a lot of the beauty that you guys have. So we went to the gardens by the bay. We went to the zoo. You guys have the best zoo in the world, by the way. It's awesome. And, and we've seen so many beautiful things. But when you look at creation, creation reveals a creator. When you look at a son, a son reveals a father. Jesus came not only to reveal God in the sense of the existence of an almighty power, but Jesus came to reveal God the Father. Do you understand the difference? Yes. Now, I will tell you that there are many people in the world, and, and let me actually even focus that statement more. There are many people in the church worldwide who can see God as God, but have a difficult time seeing God as daddy. But Paul says it this way in Romans 8, that we have received the spirit of adoption and now we can call him Abba, Father. In other words, we've received his spirit and we're not to just look at him as some distant God or some God that we are to serve or even just strict Father God, but also to see him as Papa, to see him as Daddy, to see him as Abba, to see him as the King of Kings, but the King who calls us to his lap because he's drawn us unto himself as his sons and daughters of God. Are you with me so far? So if Jesus' purpose was to reveal the Father, and we as the church are called the body of who? The body of who? Guys, it's Saturday afternoon. We have to wake up a little bit. <laughs> We're the body of who? The body of Christ. If Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father... What is the purpose of the body of Christ? To reveal the Father. Well, you say, oh, no, Brother Nick, we're supposed to get people saved. Nope, you're nobody's Savior. Jesus is the Savior. The church has spent too much time focusing on getting people saved and not enough time on living a life that reveals the Father. When we live a life that reveals the Father, you know what happens? People will ask you without you even having to say anything. They will say, what is it with you? There's something different about you. Why are you so loving even when things aren't going right? Why are you so peaceful even when you're having a difficult time? All of those actions reveal who the Father is because it's his DNA inside of you. It's his attributes inside of you that are being revealed through the way that you live your life. So we as the body are called to reveal the Father just as Jesus revealed the Father. There's something interesting about the body of Christ. If you think about it, we actually don't have a right to our own mentality or our own vision. You know why? Because the vision and the mentality doesn't come from the pinky or the foot. It comes from the head, and the head is Jesus. So our purpose as the body of Christ is to align ourselves to Jesus, align ourselves to who he is, to know him so that we can reveal him so that and make him known to others. Are you with me so far? All right, so I'm going to read a couple verses with you from, from Paul's writings. And the first one is really one of my life verses in 1 Corinthians 2. And I'll tell you why it's one of my life verses. But first, let's just read it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 
And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Amen? Amen. Now, if you know a little bit about the Apostle Paul, you would know that he actually was a Hebrew of Hebrews, is how he referred to himself, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And not a Pharisee, and sometimes we always give Pharisees a negative connotation, but not all Pharisees were, were such negative people. What he means when he says that is he was a man who knew the word of God, the Old Testament, the Torah, a man who knew the law. And he was a man who could have shown up and debated and, and spoken with eloquent words, and he could have used all of his experience to, to get into a theological debate with people to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. But you know what amazes me about Paul is this man who had all of this training in the Hebrew faith, all of this training as a Pharisee, one day is walking on the road to Damascus. And on this road to Damascus, he encounters the crucified Christ. And from that point on, he can never remove from his mind the image of the holes in Christ's hands and the glory shining off the resurrected Christ's face. So now the man who has all of this knowledge says, I really only preach two things, Jesus Christ and him crucified and a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this one of my life verses? Because Paul says, I came to you not with eloquent words. Now, if you have ever been a person who's moved to another country and had to learn another language, there have been many times in your life, like there has been in mine, where you can forget eloquent words. You can forget words sometimes because you're just trying like a small child to communicate the lunch order that you want to make at the restaurant. <laughs> and on my first trip to Brazil in 2008, I went on a missions trip and I was there leading worship in churches with a man named Randy Clark. And, uh, and on this trip, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but God just gives me his heart for these women in prostitution. He just, it's like, open heart surgery, where he just ripped open my chest and put his father's heart in me. And all of a sudden, I, I have a love and a care and a desire to help these women that I never had before. And so this happens. And then the next night, I'm in our hotel, and I see these three women prostituting on the corner of our hotel. And I call my friend, and I say, Ali, let's go out there and, and pray. And she said, yeah, let's do it. And we were so excited and so pumped to just go and, and pour out the love of God for these women that we forgot until we got there that we didn't speak Portuguese. <laughs> now, Paul says, I did not come with eloquent words, but just preaching Christ and him crucified. So I get to the front of these three ladies and I walk up to them and I say, Boa noite, which is good night, good evening. And they're like, Boa noite. And I say, Boa noite. <laughs> and they're kind of looking at me and my friend like, what do you want, you know? And I'm like, oh, Lord, give me supernaturally the language of Portuguese so that I may speak to these women. And, you know, God's like, take lessons. So that didn't happen. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's God's answer sometimes. We want the easy way out, and God's like, yeah, go sign up for classes. So... So then I remember that on the, the name tag that I had in my pocket from being on this trip, the, the ministry that I traveled with, on the back of your name tag, they had many Portuguese phrases in case you were in a church and you didn't have a translator. Because we'd be ministering, we had a team of uh, 60 people, and we would minister in churches sometimes with 30,000 members. So you would uh, pray for people at the end or pray for healing, and tons of people would come. And in case you didn't have a translator, you could look at this card, but the problem is almost all of the prayers on this card were really 
church language type phrases because they were for that setting. So how am I going to walk up to three women who are prostituting on the streets and say, may the glory of God fall upon your heads? You know, it just is kind of hard to really like be an icebreaker with that one. So I'm looking at this list and I'm like, which one of these could I possibly use? And these three girls are looking at me and my friend Allie's like, please say something. <laughs> and then I, I pick one and I say, Anji doi, which means where's the pain? Because it's healing prayers, right? It's pray for healing in church. So where's the pain? And they're, they're like, what? And I'm like, hmm, maybe I'm not pronouncing it right. Onji uh, doi, here, look, where's the pain? And they're just looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, let's try another one. So then I look at the next one and I say, well, say thing do to the first girl. Do you have pain? She's like, no. I'm like, okay. And the second one, do you have pain? No. And the third one, and to be totally honest with you, at this moment, I paused. And in my inner man, I was praying, God, let her have a disease. <laughs> Just a small one. It doesn't have to be anything big. Just something simple, a little cold or a headache, maybe a toothache. Because I've had this entire time here, and if there's not something to heal, I'm not really sure where else to go with this conversation. <laughs> So I look at her and I say, do you have pain? And she says, yes. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> it's kind of bad when you're like, that's great. You're in pain. OK. So then I, then I say, I look at the next thing, and I say, Eu posso orar para você? can I pray for you? And she's like, yeah. So I tell my friend Allie, put your hand there. She said her pain was in her stomach. Put your hand there. Let's pray for her. So we start praying for her, and she just starts weeping and weeping and weeping. And after you know, a few minutes of praying for her, and I look at her and I say again, Você tem dor? Do you have pain? And she said, no mais, no more. No more pain. And then she's smiling. It's like we watched this transformation on her face. So then I turned to the other girls, and now I'm like full of confidence, right? <laughs> so now I was like, where's the pain? And they're like, here and here and here. And so we pray for them. And in fact, that first girl helped us pray for them because she was so full of joy from this pain leaving her body. Now, you know what's amazing about that encounter? First of all, that night when I stepped out, God put this love in me for these women, and that night when I stepped out on the streets, it was like I was born to do this, and I was born to give my life for this purpose. But the second thing is that without words, without language, we were able to connect to those three women because I want to tell you that the beauty of the cross and the power of the resurrection is enough. It's already enough. Amen. You see, we live in, in a time where it's like everybody kind of wants to find uh, some new revelation, some new mystery, something that people have missed before. And I want to tell you, I've, I've studied theology, and you, you're not going to find something that people didn't miss. We now have 2,000 years of people who have studied Jesus Christ, his word. It's all there to be found but what I'm saying is that sometimes we're like, what's that new message that I can find? And we have, unfortunately, on social media and YouTube, lots of people who preach, to be totally honest, really heretical messages because they're wanting to find something and preach something that's never been heard before. And Paul, who had all of the knowledge, said, none of that matters. Jesus Christ and him crucified and the power of the resurrection. That's enough. You want to know how to reach the unreached peoples? in the nations, you want to know how to reach the lost in Singapore, the cross and the resurrection. It's enough. You don't need some, some other uh, revelation, some other thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. God's going to always teach us about who he is. You understand what I'm saying, right? God will always reveal to us who he is, and there's always something to be learned. But what I'm saying is, is sometimes we feel like, oh, I need something more. I don't have enough yet to fulfill what God's called me to do. Or I'm not, I'm not a pastor. You know, I don't have this this experience in ministry. But you know what you have? The beauty of the cross and the power of the resurrection. Amen. And it's enough. Amen. See, when I was a pastor in the Methodist church in the United States, I could go through a really busy week and I could get to church on Sunday morning and preach a message and uh, the people would come and say, wow, Pastor Nick, that was an awesome message. I could lead worship from having a busy week, having had no time in the presence of God, because I was so busy doing all the other things, but show up and lead worship and people would say, wow, worship is so beautiful today. 
And then I move to Brazil, and I start working with these girls who have been so abused, so abandoned, so broken. We've rescued girls as young as seven that had already been prostituted at that age. And let me tell you, friends, there is not a message you can preach that makes those girls better from simply preaching a message. There's not a song you can sing that makes them better. Only the cross and the resurrection. It's only the beauty of Jesus on the cross saying, I've taken all of that pain for you so that you can be restored. But I didn't leave it there because then I went to the tomb and I left it empty so that you can live new life in me. Amen. See, this is the message we carry. And it ties perfectly into what we read in John 1.18. What was the cross? It was the absolute best revelation ever of a loving father. In fact, John refers to the cross as the glorification of Jesus because he understood the cross is what will reveal who God is more than any other act that will ever take place. When Jesus opened his arms on the cross, this shows what the father looks like. When my daughter Layla was little, now she's 15 and, and beautiful and she'll stay 15 for a long time <laughs> and we've made an arrangement on that. And, um, but when she was little, she, she would always ask me, Daddy, how much do you love me? You know, and she would play that game. Maybe some of you played it. Do you love me this much? No, no, way more. Do you love me this much? Do you love me this much? And then, you know, I'd say, no, I love you this much. And one day I was praying, and God gave me this vision of Layla at the foot of the cross saying, Father God, how much do you love me? And Jesus' arms open on the cross saying, I love you this much. See, the beauty of the cross is what brings us to a place of surrender so that we can pass through the empty tomb and live in the life of the resurrection. It's not just uh, sinners saved by grace, weeping at the foot of the cross, always saying, oh, God, thank you because I was such a sinner. If you're still in that mentality, you have actually not yet fully lived the Christian experience. A friend of ours, Chris Valton, who's a pastor at Bethel Church, he said it this way, we are not sinners saved by grace. We were sinners who were saved by grace. Now we're sons and daughters. See, at some point we have to embrace the, the cross so that we can go through the tomb and live in the resurrection life and the resurrection power that he's given to us. And we see this all the time with our girls, and I'm going to share some stories with you. But first I want to read with you from 2 Corinthians Five. Are you still with me, guys? Yes. You promise? Yes. Okay. I trust you. <laughs> Listen to what Paul writes about this, this Christian life that we live, this faith that we have. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to begin in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all of these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through God, uh, through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul says that we are reconciled to God through Christ. But the message doesn't end there because in that reconciliation, we are then given the very same ministry of reconciliation. See, we're not just spectators that once we get saved, we stand on the sidelines and wait while God uses the elect few who are called to full-time ministry, let's say pastors or missionaries, to go and reach the lost. No, all of us who have been reconciled to the Father receive then the message and the ministry of reconciliation. And I want to submit to you, how many of you are believing for revival to come to Singapore? You want to see revival in Singapore? 
I believe that God's already moving in revival in Singapore and through Singapore that will flow to the rest of Southeast Asia and to the nations. Amen. But I want to tell you that revival does not just mean uh, bigger churches or fuller churches or services even more alive and with healings. All those things are great, but actually those things should just be the normal family gatherings of kingdom family. There should be healing when we get together. There should be wholeness when we get together. There should be restoration. But I want to submit to you that I believe that what Paul describes here is the definition of true revival. Revival is when those who have been reconciled enter into the ministry of reconciliation. Revival is a one-by-one -one occurrence when you have received the reconciliation and you're so overwhelmed by the goodness of your Father that you cannot contain it. So you begin to seek others who need to be reconciled to the Father. You seek to reconcile your broken relationships with others as well because you have received this ministry of reconciliation because we are the body of Christ. His ministry has become our ministry. So I like to sometimes ask when I'm traveling places and say, how many of you are called to the ministry? It's a trick question, right? Because there's usually like four or five people that raise their hands. No, everyone is called to the ministry. Not everyone will vocationally work in ministry full time, but everyone is called to the ministry because we are the body of Christ. Do you know that pastors in the church worldwide make up less than 3% of the church? But what about the other 97%, right, Pastor Allen? Man, we need the other 97% ministering in the ministry of reconciliation. Look at the world today. What's going on in the world? So much division that's happening all the time. Whether it's religion, whether it's race, whether it's socioeconomic standards, many different things that are causing division. And Jesus, when he came, came with one simple message for anybody who would hear it. The Father loves you, and if you believe in me, you'll receive new life. See, we need to be those who carry the ministry of reconciliation. We work with girls in Brazil that you would understand if they harbored bitterness and anger towards those who have harmed them. And some of them do for a season. They're all in a process, of course, and we don't necessarily look for microwave results. I think that we, sometimes in the church, we love those testimonies of the guy that was a drug addict for 20 years and someone prayed for him once and he was healed and never used drugs again. I love when God does those things. But the truth is, a testimony of someone who walks through two or three years of a healing process to be restored is just as beautiful. And so when, with a lot of our girls, it's more this process of seeing them healed and restored. But we have one girl that uh, when she uh, came to us, she came to us when she was 15 years old. And all the details of her, her story don't matter because we prefer to focus much more on what Christ has done in her life than all the hard stuff that they've gone through. Um, in fact, it's kind of funny sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes when we, we talk about our testimony, it's like we think that our testimony is all the junk we did before we knew Christ. No, your testimony is who you are in Christ now. Yeah. It's not, you know, uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in the Methodist church in America, and we'd go to a youth conference, and they'd always have these guys that I think they brought them in to scare us into the gospel, you know, <laughs> because it would be this guy that's like, I killed seven people, and I've done all of these drugs, and then I killed three more people. And, if, and like 20 minutes in, you're like, I don't think you should be out of jail right now, like with all that you're saying, you know? And it would be like 30 minutes of, of all of this darkness, and then, but then I met Jesus, brother, and my life has changed. So if you want to receive him, come to the front. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's your testimony? Everything you just said was about your past. And we had a group visiting uh, our Bethany, which is our girl's home, a few months ago, and it was actually kind of funny because this girl that I'm talking about was there, and uh, this lady who visited, she meant well, but she said, tell me your testimony. And she says, well, I came here like two years ago, and I met Jesus, and I was just baptized by the love of the Father. And she's telling her all about everything God's doing in her life. And the lady says, oh, but I mean, what's your testimony? And the girl's like, that's what I just told you. And the lady's like, no, I mean, like, before. And the girl says, oh, none of that matters anymore. Yep. And I thought, man, she gets it, yeah. you know? We, we love those stories, right? It's like we make movies about them, and we love those things. But actually, your testimony is, I met Jesus, and this is everything he's done in my life since then. That's our testimony. We're defined by him, not by the past he rescued us from. Right. And so this girl, 
Um, she, com- she came from this past of her own parents selling her when she was eight into prostitution. I mean, she lived just through horrible, horrible, horrible things. And when she came to us at 15, it was because at the previous shelter, um, there was a death threat on her life. She came from a government shelter, and there was a death threat on her life from someone uh, that had harmed her, and she had spoken out against this person. And then she was really violent and fighting with everybody in the shelter, and they, they couldn't take it anymore. And we've asked to take on these really hard cases. So they had her transferred about two hours from where she was to where we are. And she comes and was really closed. Like uh, her heart was closed, didn't want to talk to anybody, wouldn't look you in the eye. But, you know, wasn't showing any of the violence or anything like that. And so about a month or so after she gets to our home, we have this conference. We do a conference once a year that we call the Father's Love Conference. And she says, well, I'm not going. And I said, well, actually you are because every, everybody goes. And she's like, well, I'm not going. And I'm like, no, you actually are. You're, you're going. And she's like, well, I'm just going to sit in the back the whole time. I'm like, that's okay. She's like, I'll just yell and make a lot of noises so it distracts everybody. I said, that's okay. Brazilians are loud. They're not going to hear you. They're just going to keep worshiping and be loud. It's going to be fine. So she's fine, like, ah, fine. So she goes and she sits in the back. And when we're starting, just sound check, not even the service. Have any of you ever been to Brazil before? Anybody here? Guys, the Brazilian church is a beautiful, vibrant church. And they worship so loud, so loud. There is no sound check. You you worship team members would appreciate it. You start to strum because you're just tuning. And they're like, are they rushed to the front? And you're like, oh, no, I'm just, eh, whatever, okay, we'll just do it. And so that happened this night. And Rachel and I were leading worship, and I start to just strum. And all of our girls from Bethany, from our girls' home, came to the front. And then a bunch of girls that had been in the house previously but now live in in some of the poorer communities around our base have been restored to their families and whatnot. They came up to the front too. So we're just there sound checking, and our girls are there worshiping already. And and that girl's in the back with her arms crossed, just staring like, I don't want to be here. And so in the front, there's this girl who at the time was nine years old, and she has her arms up, and she's worshiping like this, and she's already singing and just crying out, I love you, Jesus, I love you. And then she starts to look around like this behind her. She's looking for somebody. And she sees that girl way in the back, and she goes back to that girl and grabs her hand. She's never met this girl before because she had, she had, had uh, lived with us for two years, but had since been restored to her, her mother. And so she grabs this girl's hand and says, you don't want to sit back here. You need to come up there. I think the brother that was giving the announcement said something about the anointing in the front being stronger. So, <laughs> so she grabs that girl's hand, and the girl's kind of like giving her a look, but she doesn't give her any time to say no. She just pulls her up there and then brings her to the front. And this is what she does. She puts her hand on that girl's heart, and she says, Father, do in her what you did in me. This little nine-year-old girl. You know what's amazing? This little nine-year-old girl does not have a father. She never had a reference of a father, earthly, until she came to live with us. But she encountered the father, and he changed her life. So she prays this prayer, and that other girl just hits the ground and starts crying. Spends the rest of the night there crying on the ground. The next day, we come back to the church and she goes right to that same spot. I, I kind of think she thought it was like the spot, you know, because she went to that same spot, laid down, and just started crying. For three days, that's what she did. And every time that Rachel would go and, or any of our staff would go and just check on her to make sure these were good tears and you're doing okay, and she would just say to us, he's so beautiful. Jesus is so beautiful. So a friend of ours was preaching from this passage that night that she had this experience, this encounter with the Father. And, um, and he preached this, he, pre- he focused his message on what it means to be a new cre- creature in Christ, a new creation. And the next uh, day after the conference, it's Monday morning, and in our home we have, we believe totally in inner healing and those things, but we also believe a lot in therapy. So we have psychologists on staff and social workers that work with our girls' cases and one of our therapists sits down with this girl and she says, so how was the conference? And she says, oh, it was amazing. I have to tell you what happened to me. And she said, oh, tell me. And she said, well, 
When I came home from the conference, I went and found all of the old photographs from my life, and I ripped them all up, and I threw them in the trash. And the psychologist said, well, why did you do that? Because it could be a positive thing or a negative thing. And she said, because the man that was preaching said that when we are in Christ, we're a new creature. And I will not be a prisoner to my past any longer. Yeah. I've, been, I've been made new, Chia. That's what she said to her. And the psychologist said, that's amazing. And she said, yeah, I'm, I'm not the same person anymore. I've been totally changed. So that night, we have every Monday night at our missions base, an uh, open worship service. And people come from all different kinds of backgrounds. And people come from many different churches and things. And, and I was just, at the end of the night, was praying for people. And she comes up to me and says, can I help you pray? Guys, this is a girl who the day before would not look you in the eyes. And I said, yeah, of course you can. So I'll be totally honest with you. We're in family here, right? So I can be real. I was really tired. So I was doing kind of like courtesy prayers. I know it's terrible, but I'm just being real with you. (laughs) A courtesy prayer is when you've already prayed for like a thousand people and you're exhausted. So you're like, bless him. Bless him, Lord. (laughs) Right? So I'm just kind of like, <laughs> I'm just being honest. So I'm like just that, you know, put my hand on the shoulder. Amen. And then this girl comes in that moment and says, can I help you pray? I'm like, yeah, man. Every person, she grabbed them and pulled them into her arms. This is a girl that you couldn't even touch before because of all the trauma she'd been through. Now she's holding people, even men. And you know what she's praying for each one of them? Father, do in them what you did in me. You made me new. Make them new. (laughs) A couple days later, she comes to me and she says, "Um, would you help me pray? I said, sure. How can I help you pray? Something specific. She said, I want to pray to forgive my father and forgive all those men. I don't have the words. And to be honest, I thought, well, I don't have the words either. Because I'm like, a, I'm, a, I'm a daddy. I have four kids, right? And I'm that kind of guy where I love everybody, but you mess with my kids, <laughs> and I'm coming after you. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, one of the hardest things about our calling is dealing with that. Because all of the girls that we care for, all of my worst nightmares for my daughters have already happened to them. And being some tough dad doesn't help them. Do you understand what I mean by that? It's like I can't just protect them because it already happened. Now I need to learn from the father how to love them through the pain that they've gone through. And sometimes for me, it's like I want to find these men. And I want to see justice happen. My justice, not God's justice. So it's hard sometimes. And she says, well, help me pray. And I said, I think you just need to say the words that, that are in your heart. And this is what she prayed. She said, Jesus... When I saw how beautiful you are, I forgot about all they did to me. So show those men your beauty. And I thought, man, I could not have prayed a better prayer. I don't think the greatest theologian could have written a better prayer. Because the truth is, you want to see your your enemy, you want to see justice done, you know what you should pray for your worst enemy? For the goodness of God to overcome them. You know why? Because it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. See, we want to see like justice happen. God's justice looks like goodness coming. And in goodness, there's repentance. Doesn't mean there's no consequences. But this was her prayer. Jesus, show them how beautiful you are. This little girl understood this passage that Paul's talking about better than most of us understand it. She received Jesus. She's reconciled to the Father. She's been made a daughter of of God. And what does she first think about? There's others who need to be reconciled to the Father. How can I pray for them that they would have the same experience? There was another girl that we met. By the way, that girl, um, just something that I think is always cool to mention, because sometimes we hear testimonies from people you know, that come from Mission Field or, or, or anything like that, and it just sounds like it's always rainbows and butterflies, right? Our, our girls, they don't like all of a sudden not have problems. They still have their challenges. Do you know what's so beautiful? When they encounter the Father, then they know I have a Father who loves me even in my challenges. So I can make a mess and I can, you know, throw things and all that stuff, but God's still going to love me through it. And that girl has just become just like the biggest lover you could ever imagine. I mean, she will hug you. If any of you ever come to visit us in Hasifi, 
you will know who she is just by her hugs because she embraces everybody. She's just so full of love, just been transformed by the love of God, really. And she's just about to graduate high school and, and come and live in our... Um, oh, I, for, I should tell that part of the story. What time do we need to be done just to... 5.30, right? 5.30. Okay, cool. Just making sure. 5.30 Brazil time? Or No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so, so, so speaking in, in, in this line of being reconciled, so this girl, she lives with us then for two years, totally transformed, God's touching her, um, but still you know, fragile from what she's gone through. So we're helping her, and she's going through our, our discipleship process, and she's going through... Uh, all the different things that we offer at our house, and she lives in our girls' home. And one day, our judge, who we have a very good relationship with, but we as a, as a rescue home, we work with the local children's court. And our judge decides that because she has a, a, a dispute with the judge from her hometown, remember I told you she came from this other town? That to basically stick it to that judge, she's going to transfer back anybody from his town from her from the homes in her jurisdiction, basically to just kind of get back at him for something they disagreed about. So she tells us this, and I say, I, I'm not going to let you transfer a child because you had a disagreement with the judge. I mean, she had a death threat on her life in that little town. Our city is a city of 5 million people. The town she comes from is a town of like 2,000 people. Someone in a town of 2,000 people threatens your life. You understand what I mean? It's not like you can really hide. So I fought this for two weeks, and the judge would not let go, and she just said, this is my decision. She's being transferred whether you like it or not. So then Rachel and I have to tell her this news, and I'm thinking, this is going to crush her because she came from this town where many of the men in this town abused her. When, when she was rescued, she was in, literally in a hole in the ground, in an old cistern in the ground. She spent a year in this hole in the ground. And now she's going to go back to that place, and we have to tell her that. And we have to take her out of the school where she's advanced so, so much in her education and take her away from all the people that have cared for her and loved her through this healing process. And so we call her in, and the worst part was she thought we had some surprise to tell her. So she comes in and says, what's the surprise? I can't wait to hear. And I already just started to cry. And I said, you know, Manu, I, I have really difficult news to tell you. And we fought this decision, but unfortunately, the decision's been made. You're being transferred back to that government shelter. And she just lost it, just wept and wept and wept on Rachel's lap. And then I'm, I'm sitting there thinking like a dad, right? How can I fix this? How can I fix this? What can I do? I can just go and tell that judge I'm not doing it. I can, what, what can I do to make this better? And she looks up at me and looks up at Rachel and she says, do you know what this is? And I thought, well, I can think of a number of words to describe what this is, but none of them are good. And she says, this is ascending. And I said, what do you mean? She said, God's sending me as a missionary back to that little town. Because people there need to know Jesus like I do. And they won't even recognize me because I'm not the same person. It's okay, Chio Ichia. It's okay. God's sending me as a missionary. I know this is his purpose. And when I was thinking, like, retaliation, what can I do to get back at that judge? What can I do to make this better? What can I do to block the path? And what can I do? She's thinking reconciliation. And she's thinking the purposes of God on her life. So she goes to this, back to this shelter, and we told her, we're going to come visit you in a week. And she calls us from the, the shelter there and says, Bring your guitar. We're going to have a worship service. Well, it's a government shelter. So I don't know how it is in Singapore, but if it's government shelter, you can't do a Christian service there. So I thought, well, okay, I mean, I'll bring the guitar. We can play some songs, but we can't do like a worship service, you know? And so we get there that day, and I start to look for the director because I want to make sure that it's okay that I even like bring this guitar in. Uh, and, but I couldn't find her because Manu had already set a bunch of chairs up and that lady was sitting on the front row and she called all the kids in that shelter and all the workers and we got there and she said, okay, let's go. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like get the guitar out and, and I start playing a song. She says, no, 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 not that one. Sing Son of Righteousness, which is a song that we wrote. 
And the bridge to the song comes from Malachi and says that he's restoring the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers. Man, we hit that part, and she just starts preaching it to these kids and these workers from the shelter. She's like, this is what Jesus does. He restores families, and he restores you to the Father. And she just starts giving her testimony. She tells everything about what she had gone through and tells them about all of the encounters she had with the Father in her time there and says, now God sent me back here to tell you that the same love is available for you. So who wants to receive his love today? And we're just there like amazed that this is happening, you know? From that time on, these workers would call Rachel from this shelter and just be in tears. Sometimes they'd just be like, I don't know what happened, but she prayed for me and I felt this fire and I don't know what to do with my life. <laughs> and Rachel just like counsel these women on the phone. Now, whenever we go there to visit her, she comes sometimes to our house and sometimes we go there. And whenever we go there, it's like there's a line of people wanting, to, wanting prayer and wanting to talk to us because this girl's like a wrecking ball of love that just tears down walls anywhere she goes. She has understood this message. If I'm reconciled to the Father, my ministry becomes a ministry of reconciliation. The truth is the church only really has two ministries, reconciliation and edification. Everything that we do can fall into those two things. We're to reconcile others and be ministers of reconciliation and then edify them as sons and daughters of God. That's why I love so much the, the church phrase that you guys have here. This is what we do. It's what we believe in. Are you guys with me? Yes. One last story, and then I want to share one more scripture verse with you before we close. There's another girl that I met. When we first moved to Brazil, I went and visited a number of, of shelters because I wanted to see what was already being done. So I visited Christian shelters. I visited spiritist shelters, government shelters. I just kind of went to anything that I could find as an example. And in one of these places, I went and um, met this girl named Duda. And she was 16 when I met her, and she had a two-year-old daughter, this beautiful little girl. And the whole day that I was there, she was kind of, she actually was bilingual and I was still learning Portuguese. So she was helping me and showing me around and translating for the director. So I really had a lot of time with her. And actually that night, I trained some of their, their uh, ministry staff to go out to the streets and I took them out to the streets to minister to these women in the red light district. And she asked if she could go and the director said she could. So she went with me and helped translate. So this girl just amazed me, and I'm, the whole time I'm thinking, like, this 16-year-old girl, she's living in this shelter. What is her story? Because she's just such an amazing person. And I, so I asked her, tell me how you ended up here. And she said, well, when I was eight, my father, he had this small business, and he owed a lot of money because he was a gambler. And he one day had his debtors come, and he didn't have any way to pay them, and the man suggested to him, you could pay me with your daughter if you give her to me for a night. And she's telling me this story about how that started her at eight years old into being prostituted until she was 14. And when she was 14, her own father took her and she got pregnant. And she looked at me and she said, to you, Nikki, you know my daughter that you met? I said, yeah. She said, that's my daddy's baby. My heart just exploded in me. And I was thinking like this just being honest with you, I was thinking, this kind of guy, man, like I don't have hope for that kind of person. That's what I was thinking. And I was just, you know, I already had tears in my eyes, and I said, Duda, tell me how you, how you deal with all of that. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, I mean, how do you deal with, with all that you've gone through? She said, in what way? I said, well, there's got to be like bitterness and anger and pain. And she said, oh, no, no. Jesus is so beautiful that when I saw his beauty, all of that pain and bitterness went away. She said, you know what my sincerest prayer is now to you, Nikki? Every day I pray that my father would come to know Jesus, that those men would come to know Jesus. Because if they saw how beautiful he is, they wouldn't want to hurt anybody else anymore. You know what that is? That's the beauty of Christ and him crucified. The greatest message we have for the world is that Jesus was crucified and rose again, not only to forgive us, but to redeem us. Not only to forgive us of our sins, but to reconcile us to the Father. See, reconciliation is so much deeper than just forgiveness. Forgiveness is a part of it. But we as humans, our understanding of forgiveness is, 
I can forgive you, but I won't forget what you did, right? But the Bible says that God, who is omniscient, you know what omniscient means? He knows everything. Do you think that God knows everything? Are you sure? Is he forgetful? Are you sure? The God who knows everything chooses to forget one thing. He takes your sins and he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. That's reconciliation. It's not just, okay, I've forgiven you, but don't mess up again. It's, I've forgiven you. The memory of those things doesn't even exist. And so a holy God can say, come and sit on my lap. You've been reconciled to me as sons and daughters of God. And these girls, the stories that I told you today, they've encountered that God and understood that about his character. <laughs> Last verse I want to read with you is in 2 Corinthians 3. You guys still good? Yeah. Okay, I think it's like 4 in Brazil a.m. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, it's a heck of a time change. I think it's 11 hours right now. So yeah, you know, you, you mentioned it's 36 hours to get there. That's about what it took. But you know, if you come to visit us, you get 11 of those hours back. So, <laughs> so, so it's not too bad. <laughs> Put them in your bank for later. <laughs> Second Corinthians 3. Verse 17 and 18, Paul says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. But we all, everybody say all. all. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. In this passage, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but if you read before this, Paul is comparing the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And he's saying in the Old Covenant, Moses went to the presence of God, and just at looking at the presence of God, his countenance changed, and he needed to wear a veil. So when he comes down off the mountain, his face is reflecting the glory of God, and he needs to wear a veil. You guys know the story, I think, right? So the people need to see Moses only with this veil on, otherwise it's too bright. But I want you to understand something and something Paul is saying here. Moses reflected the glory that he looked at. But now Paul says, but we all, not one person, not one messenger, that's old covenant. Old covenant is God raises up one prophet, one king, one deliverer, one judge, and that one becomes the messenger to the people. But Paul says, in the new covenant, we all with unveiled faces as beholding in a mirror. You know, it's amazing. In their times, the mirror was not like we have today, glass and perfectly clear. A mirror then was a piece of metal that they would polish up and see their reflection in. That's important to understand because how do we look into the face of Jesus? Paul doesn't say, He's not referring to a mirror today where you can say, oh yeah, there's that perfect reflection. In their day, to see a reflection, you had to really stare into that piece of metal to see the reflection. Paul's saying when we intently stare at the face of Jesus with no veil, he transforms us not to reflect his glory, but he actually transforms us into his image, which is glory. And in that transformation, we then go from glory to glory. We live a lifestyle that is glorious. See, how many of you have heard before the metaphor where somebody says, we are like the moon and he is the sun and we reflect his light. Have anybody ever heard that before? Terrible theology. <laughs> <laughs> because Jesus doesn't say, you are like a reflection of the light for the world. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And here, Paul doesn't say, you become transformed into a better, shinier version of yourself. You know what I think is amazing about our faith? Jesus did not come to make a better version of you. He came to transform you into his image. And he is the perfect beloved son of God. 
See, we, we live in a generation where everything is about fixing our image. We have apps that you can fix your picture before you post it. I think that's terrible, <laughs> especially if it's on a dating site. Because <laughs> what happens then when you do go to that date and you're like, whoa, All right? because the picture, you just, this is very different. <laughs> See, we, we have a culture that's obsessed with image because we never are too far from these things that are always telling us what we look like. But Paul says, instead of a mirror, look at Jesus. He is your mirror. And he reflects to you who you are. He tells you who you are. And he transforms you into his image. What we see through the lives of these girls are girls who, despite much pain and trauma, when they look in the face of Jesus, they become transformed into his image. It's not just a better version. It's not just, well, good, now they're in a shelter and they're not in that trauma anymore. No, Jesus didn't die to put us in orphanages. Jesus didn't die to just improve our life a little bit better. Jesus died and rose again so that we could have his new life. Do you know that when he says, if you believe in me, you'll have everlasting life, in the Greek it actually says, you'll have my everlasting life. In other words, that which is mine I give to you. Would you stand with me? You guys are great. Close your eyes. And I just want, I want to pray with you, but for just a moment, just think about the beauty of the cross. Think about the beauty of Jesus. Sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes the longer we're in the Christian faith, the more normal that becomes. But brothers and sisters, there are times where we need to stop and look again at the cross and see the beauty of the one who knew no sin but became sin so that we could be called the righteousness of God. See, we will never stop for all of eternity. We will never stop looking at the beauty of Jesus. He himself defined eternal life as knowing him and knowing his father in John 17, 3. Some of you here today, you, you're maybe a brand new Christian and others, maybe you've been walking with the Lord for 30 years. But you know, it's amazing for all of eternity, we will discover the height, the depth, the breadth, and the width of his love. We will never get to a point where we say, oh, we've seen all that there is of God. No, for all of eternity, we will see how beautiful he is. <laughs> so much so that in heaven, they sing holy, holy, holy. And every time they sing it, he reveals another layer of his beauty and glory. And it causes them to sing again, holy, holy, holy. Ha <laughs> ha. Just think for a moment on the beauty of the cross. Think about the power of the resurrection. That tomb is empty. Think about the one who came to reveal the Father in all that he did. Think about the one who reconciled you and I to the Father. We're not orphans, we're sons and daughters. <laughs> sons and daughters who reveal his glory. <laughs> you know why we can reveal his glory? Because now we belong to it, it's our inheritance. Paul says it this way in Romans 8, that we are children of God, not only children, but heirs and co-heirs with Christ. 
we get to reveal his glory because revealing his glory is as simple as saying to the world, have you met my papa yet? He's amazing. Huh. Just put your hand on your heart. I just want to pray for, for you. Father, I thank you that your love is the same in Singapore as it is in Brazil, as it is in the United States, as it is in Mozambique, as it is in any other place, God, that your love supersedes nations. And I just pray this, this afternoon for my brothers and sisters, for my family here in Singapore, a fresh baptism of your love. A fresh baptism of your love, Father. A fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. Um, Father, your word says in Ephesians 1, 19, that you are always pouring out your power upon those who believe. And as we sang earlier today, we believe in who you are. So pour out your power upon us again this morning, this afternoon. Pour out your love upon us, Father. Fill us with your fire that we would be burning with that same message of reconciliation that in our hearts, Father, we could not ignore those on the bus on the way to work, that we could not ignore those in, in our universities, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods, because we would just see them as opportunities to reconcile to the Father. That we would understand that we were adopted and now we are agents of adoption. That we carry the spirit of adoption. And I pray, Father, that each one of us today would leave this place with an even greater understanding of who we are as sons and daughters. Um, Father, I also want to pray for anyone here who's been through abuse and trauma or abandonment like that of the girls that we're working with in Brazil. Father, I thank you that you, you don't just remove us from the pain and put us in a safe place, but you redeem us, you restore us. And I just pray today, Father, for anyone here who's passed through those things, that through these testimonies, they would be redeemed and restored that these testimonies that we've shared today would give them the faith to believe. I'm not gonna have nightmares anymore. I'm not gonna have difficult times sleeping anymore. I'm not gonna have trouble trusting people anymore because I'm being restored by the love of my Father. So we declare your restorative love here today, Father. Fill us with your love, Father. so that we can live as sons and daughters who reveal your glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.